Good morning. It's uh, good to see you today. I think uh, some of you uh, haven't yet put on your makeup, and some of you guys are wandering around in your t-shirt, but that's okay. If you hear God's word today, that's what really matters. And uh, I'd like to uh, encourage you today with some uh, photos and a little video footage of uh, the building that is going up in Uganda that we've been involved with, because as that building goes up, then that's creating our building here at home. Uh, so I'd like you to see some of these uh, video and uh, photographs of what's happening there. You can uh, this is you the can see there uh, on the site. And, uh, this the walls is are are going up. How far? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's quite exciting. Uh, for us and for them. Uh, in fact, uh, Pastor Peter was telling me that uh, it's actually become a tourist site because uh, it's a, a very this strange is... and unique situation that someone would build a church building, a sheep shed this large in the bush. And because it will be a an Antioch type center where there'll be pastors, conferences, and all kinds of training facilities for various areas of ministry. Uh, it needs to accommodate all that. And, and I'm sure once it's built, it'll still be too small. But uh, they're, they're all excited. And we pray that the weather is kind to them so that they can continue this process. And, uh, you could uh, see from that last shot there that the uh, the, the actual walls uh, start a little bit away from the outside wall uh, so as to provide that uh, extra cushion in case the ground shakes again a little bit. But uh, thank God for the progress that's being made and, and that will continue. And thank you for your, for your giving and your sowing. And thank you again for the crown of blessing giving that uh, you've been contributing to as you've gone online and and uh, donated money. Uh, Pastor Peter is 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 coined a phrase. He says it's it's the the gospel of food. He said I had no idea that when I went into communities and and I, I went there with food for the people who were starving, that would actually bring about. Uh, salvation and family reconciliation and, and other miracles and provide uh, opportunity and doors open for even more miracles. Uh, he was saying that uh, even the radio ministry has, has blossomed in its fruitfulness. And yesterday, 92 people prayed to receive Christ as their Savior. Many called in with testimonies of, of God's goodness and grace. And so, uh, the work of God there is is going forward and being blessed and lives are being touched and changed despite uh, coronavirus. And uh, so thank you for your giving to the Crown of Blessing Fund. Uh, I'd like for us to actually pray for four nations today, Ghana, Uganda, Nigeria, and Ethiopia. I know that the whole world is in turmoil and there are lots of very critical needs, uh, but I just felt we should pray for these nations. And uh, we'd, we'd heard from uh, our missionary Bev, who had reminded us that uh, Ghana is having their elections this week. We know that Uganda is coming up with their elections and there is great turmoil in Nigeria and Ethiopia. So I want you to join with me in prayer uh, today for these countries. Uh, that God will bring good out of bad. Father, we come into an alignment and agreement today with all the saints in these four nations, in Ghana, Nigeria, Uganda, and Ethiopia, that are praying that there might be peace in their country while the elections are going on and the, the wars and the fractions and the divisions and the conflicts will come to an end and there will be a reign of peace and opportunity. We pray that you would uh, encourage every saint, every believer, every leader, every church 
and cause your people, Lord, to continue their intercession in faith. Thank you, Lord, that you said righteousness exalts a nation and let your church, Lord, cause your people to walk in that place where they deliver heaven's resources to their troubled countries. And we pray, Lord, for every person who listens and watches today this message, that their hearts will be encouraged and renewed and they will hear something specific for themselves. Thank you, Lord, that you made this opportunity. And though they made the decision, uh, Lord, we know that you have something specific in mind to communicate today to each person who listens. Thank you for being our helper today. In Jesus' name, amen. I'd like to begin with our key scriptures we've been talking about, faith in the last days, and that it's, it's faith that releases God's grace, God's provision, God's blessing uh, to us. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16 says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace. And in a, in a few minutes, I want to talk a little bit. How do you come boldly to the throne of grace? How do you get there? I mean, if the throne of grace is in heaven, how do you get there? How do you come there boldly? I believe I have uh, an insight to share with you how we actually do that. But I want to carry on with this verse. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace or receive grace to help in our time of need. You know, I rise every day and I ask for God's mercy and God's grace for myself and my family and for all of you, even those who, who don't live in London or attend our congregation. Uh, I ask for God's mercy and grace on you. And, you know, you never realize how much your life is based on the mercy and the grace of God. And I want to say to you today that I had a fresh reminder of the mercy and the grace of God. Because was it not for the mercy of God, I would not be speaking to you this morning. I could have died on Friday night uh, in my home as I had gone to bed and I decided to get out of bed. And as I stepped out of bed, my wife noticed a great pile of blood on the bedclothes. And I didn't even notice it. I didn't feel it. And she said, isn't that blood? And I looked and uh, the bedclothes were soaked with blood. And so I, I stood onto the floor and I watched the blood coming copiously out the side of my foot. And it was, I thought I, I should do something about it. So I sat down on the bed and uh, somebody else in the room was quite excited, <laughs> should I say. Uh, and because there was now blood all over the carpet and, and it was just pouring out of the side of my foot. Anyway, uh, plasters were found and one after the other, we put them on. It kept coming out to the side of the plaster till eventually we got the blood stopped. And then there was... Uh, all of the cleanup. And the message was that had I not noticed, or my wife hadn't noticed that, I would have just gotten back into bed and, and gone off to sleep and would probably, apart from some divine intervention, bled out and awakened with Jesus. I wouldn't be here today. And that is a reminder of the mercy and the grace of God. And I know that all the good that would come out of my life is good that came to my life. And I believe that God wants to remind us all in this time where the world feels under such threat that you're alive because of the mercy and the grace of God. Walk with him, depend on him, trust him, put your eyes on him, take your eyes off those things that uh, threaten and make you fearful and, and uh, constantly prompt 
negative emotions and perspectives. And as you put your eyes on him, he not only sustains you, but he enables you to go on and finish your assignment. And, you know, I'm, I'm great today. In fact, uh, Saturday I did my prescribed 6,000 steps plus, And so I'm, I'm in good shape. I have no idea why the side of my foot opened up and the blood was coming out, but it stopped and I'm in good shape and good health today. And I thank God for that. Now, I know that were I to pass from this life, I'd be in the best place I could ever be forever. Uh, but I don't want to go until I finish my assignment. And so I just had a little knock, knock on the door of my life to say, It's the mercy and grace of God that sustains you. And I believe God's preparing us for awesome, amazing things. And as, as those things come to us, that they might come through us to others, we want to be reminded of where they came from. Every good and perfect gift comes from Him. And so today I want to uh, talk further uh, about uh, the grace of God that God intended that you and I experience in so many more ways than we currently do. You know, I come to the throne of grace every day and all too often I don't come away with as much as I should. <laughs> But I'm thankful that it's there and it's, it's there for the taking. And so along with you, I expect to receive more grace and mercy in the days that lie ahead because it isn't just survival for me. It's that I might be a conduit of, of that grace, a pipeline of that grace and favor and goodness and blessing to people who have nothing, who are desperate and fearful. So I'd like for us to uh, look at Isaiah 51 and verse 6 and share with you a perspective and a means by which we come boldly to the throne of grace. You know, uh, sometimes it's difficult to kind of get your head around a biblical concept. God says, I want you to come to the throne of grace, the great storehouse of heaven, the bank of heaven, whatever you want to call it. I want you to come boldly. Well, okay. Yes, Lord, but, but how do I do that? I mean, if, if you said go to Sainsbury's, I know how to get in my car and drive the, the course and get there and so on and go inside and, and pay. And, and I, I know how to do all that's very practical, logical, easy. But how do I come boldly to the throne of grace? And I'd like to share with you uh, right now from this verse something I think is vital in our understanding of this place where everything that we need for life and godliness is located and how we go there to, to get it and dispatch it. Isaiah 51 and verse, verse 6 says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. So you lift up your eyes to the heavens. As soon as you lift your eyes in faith, To the Lord, then your perspective changes your position. Because you know, when you lift your eyes in faith to the Lord, now you're in a position where the Bible says you can look at the earth beneath. You can look at the earth beneath. Many people are just constantly looking at the earth. They cry out to heaven, they pray, uh, but they haven't come in faith to the Lord, and subsequently, the, the way you know you've come in faith to the Lord is now you're looking down on your stuff. You know, if I can put it this way, suppose somebody took you to the top of the tallest building in the world, which is in Dubai, and they gave you a set of binoculars, and then they put a, a small package on the ground, uh, And they call that package your stuff that needs fixing. And you're up at the top of this extremely tall building trying to find your stuff with your binoculars. And you look down and you actually see it. And there it is, that little tiny package. And it says your stuff. 
Well, now you have a totally different viewpoint, thought pattern, emotion about that because it looks, number one, so small. Number two, it looks now subservient, inferior to you, which is all true. And now you can deal with it, as we'll see in a moment here, in the way that God intended. If you don't see a thing correctly, you don't respond to it correctly. And so here, the prophet gives us something very, very valuable, is that God tells us to come boldly to the throne of grace. We know the throne of grace is the Ark of the Covenant, because the Ark of the Covenant, according to the book of Hebrews, is the physical earthly pattern of a spiritual entity in heaven. So we come boldly to the throne of grace. Well, you, you go there, so to speak, spiritually, when you come in faith to the Lord. He that comes to God. And so when you come to God, you're coming to the throne of his favor, the throne of his provision. You, you're coming by faith. He that comes to God must believe that he is, he is, and he's there, and that he is a rewarder. That's all the stuff he's got simply because you came in faith, just like your salvation. You came to the throne of grace, mercy and grace, and in your time of need, and you said, God, I believe you're there. I believe your son died on the cross for me. And so you made this transaction. Father, I, I'm a sinner. I agree with your word. I'm a sinner. I came out of the womb a sinner. I was born a sinner. I believe that. I, I believe that you said you would wash my sins away and forgive me if I would ask. And so I ask, Lord, and you wash my sins away. Thank you, Lord. And you have this this amazing transaction at the throne of grace in your salvation. Well, the whole of our life journey is a parallel. It's a, it's a, a continual story of what took place initially. We come to that throne of grace. And so in our earthly life, we have all kinds of stuff. We got our, our work life, our family life, our financial life, our health life, uh, our ministry life, whatever it is, we got all this stuff that's going on. And, the Bible says here in verse 6, lift up your eyes to the heavens. Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. When you have this faith look, you're now shift into a different position. You're now superior to what is beneath you. What is beneath you. And then you are empowered to deal with it in a different way. Some people are always rehearsing their stuff. You know, they haven't, they haven't risen in this faith approach to the throne of grace. Romans 5, 2 says, We have access into this grace by faith in which we now stand. So it's only as you believe when you look up, to the heavens, when you look to the Lord, it's only as you believe that you're, you're now there, that you're in this place where you're now standing in grace. Standing in grace. The Bible says you're standing in grace. Do you feel like you're standing in grace? Well, Pastor, I, I don't feel like I'm standing in grace. Well, let's come back to that throne of grace Lord, I believe you're there. You're for me. You made all this provision for me. I believe I'm with you now. Thank you, Lord. Now I can look down on my stuff, all those things that, that come toward me and at me and all the struggles and the conflicts and difficulties and deficits that, that I face. I can now look down on them and I can deal with them from this superior position. So here the prophet says your perspective alters your position. Once you come in faith to the Lord, you now are superior to what it was that you were coming for. And you can look down on it. That's why he says, lift up your eyes to the heavens and look at the earth beneath. When we look up, we're in that position 
to look down at our circumstances. Faith puts you in the grace position to look down on your stuff. Are you still standing in your stuff or are you looking down on it? And, you know, from this new position, you are meant to speak with authority to various things. And these things are literal and figurative, as we'll see in both the natural and the spiritual world. Because words are powerful. You know, it's a funny thing how you can live in this life, this world, and not believe that words are powerful. They are powerful. We understand how powerful they are in so many contexts. Uh, wars have, have started over words. You know, before any shot was fired or any arrow was shot or spear was thrown or whatever other means of warfare, words created a condition. We see it in the book of Genesis. So words are powerful and they're powerful relationally. Uh, I've shared with you about people who, uh, when they were growing up, they heard words from their parents that ravaged their entire lives. My parents never loved me. My father said he hated me. My mother said she wished I had never been born. My mother said she was hoping for a girl. My mother said she was hoping for a boy. And I was such a disappointment. And I've continued to be so. It's the story of my life. Words are powerful. We understand that words have a power relationally to build and to destroy. But words also have the power to create and to make things disappear, as, as we'll see. And God wants us to discover the power of words and the power of our words in a, in a new way in these last days. Because it is through words in one sense, that you will help bring about change in your world and in the lives of others. You know, we saw those uh, pictures and a little video clip of the building that's being uh, constructed there in Uganda. Well, it was a few years ago, I stood on that plot of ground that it was just jungle and uh, just uh, uh, the bush, as Peter calls it, with, with uh, banana trees around there. And we stood there on that piece of ground that they owned and lifted our hands to the Lord and said, in the name of Jesus, a new sheep shed will be built on this site to the glory of God and to reach into the community and, and release God's grace and love and power throughout the nations. And that's what is happening. You know, and on that day, when we stood there to declare those things with words, when you couldn't see with natural eyes anything but just jungle. We no sooner did that than a family came just from above the property. And as they came down to where we were praying, they came and asked, would we pray with them to receive Christ as their savior? They were from another religion. We hadn't preached the gospel. We hadn't done anything. All we did was say words. And, and it was as though God was saying, yes, I'm making a sheep shed because there's a harvest coming. I want to say to you, that's not because I'm a pastor or I'm anybody special or unique uh, or different from anybody else. No, that is a provision for every believer, every believer. And God wants us to grasp how valuable, how powerful and amazing our words are when they are words uh, that are consistent with God's word and they're spoken in faith, they, they can make such a radical difference. And so the, uh, the Bible gives a list of things that are spoken to in the Bible. You know, I think words are important and I think specific words are, are very important. 
And I think this little preposition too is extremely important. And I've kind of given uh, a list of uh, some 16 things. There are other things that uh, the Bible says we're to speak to. But if you're a Christian, if you're a believer, then you should learn to speak to things and not just about things. The whole world is speaking about things. That's the only resource they have is they can talk, 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 talk about what has happened, what might happen, what could happen, why it shouldn't have happened. You and I can make a difference with our words, just as God makes a difference with his words. And that's why these words are so important. Because they are the words spoken by spirit-filled believers, by people who are, are people of faith that can make such a difference. I mean, we, everything that we know about today was created by spoken words. Creation, as the book of Hebrews says, the worlds were framed by the word of God, the spoken word of God. And so we are like our dad and we are to help create a different world by the speaking of words. And so I, I, I want to just very quickly go through uh, some of the things that the Bible tells us that we are uh, to speak to and give some examples of things uh, that we are to speak to and not about. And we do so because we have an authority to do so. And you say, well, no, I'm not used to that. I, I didn't grow up with that. That's not my religious tradition. You know, prayer is, is telling God stuff that, that needs to be fixed, and, and you leave it with him. Well, there's nothing wrong with petitions at all. You can ask God, and the Bible says you should ask him. But the Bible also says that God expects you to speak to things and command them to change. And the Bible makes that plain and it makes that clear in both the Old Testament and the New Testament. We understand how we're to speak to things. And, you know, it takes a, a while to kind of learn this because we, we all have our religious traditions and our practices that we're, we're, we're well in the groove of. But I'd like to just look at a few verses of Scripture. I won't probably go through all of them today, but uh, the Bible says that uh, people speak to idols. Isaiah 42 and verse 17 says, Those who trust in idols who say to images, they speak to an idol, whether it's made of concrete or wood or stone or whatever, who say two images. They go up to an image and they say to it, you are our gods. You are our gods. And we know that those idols, that wood, that stone, or even those demons that are behind their faith are not going to produce anything good but people actually speak that. They'll get some stone, some wood uh, that was carved into something that man made and said, okay, you're our God. You're our God. And so uh, across the world, people have little God boxes. They have all kinds of things where they're, they're speaking to idols. They're saying to them as, as though the, there was, uh, it was a, an actual uh, person or spiritual being that could respond to them. Well, have, have you ever had a piece of wood or a piece of stone talk back to you? If you did, you probably ran. <laughs> the Bible says that, uh, that uh, God's people were to speak to the north and the south in Isaiah 43. It says, I'll say to the north, give them up and to the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons from afar and my daughters from the ends of the earth. So if your children want away from, from Christ, you can say to the north, give them up. To the south, do not hold them back. Bring my sons and my daughters from the ends of the earth. And, you know, uh, if I, I believe it was last Sunday or maybe the Sunday before, 
I, I shared with you a story of uh, a woman uh, who husband had wandered off in, in Africa during this pandemic, discouraged because he could not provide for his family. And I was on a video call with the pastor and, and he said, would you pray for this woman? I said, what's the story? And he said, well, her husband had wandered off and she didn't know where he was. And, and uh, you know, they didn't have food and, and they have small children. And she didn't know when he was coming back. And, and so she was so discouraged. And anyway, we ministered to her a little bit. And I said, okay, now let's use one of your powerful weapons. And so she was with a, a group of other leaders and I said, what's your husband's name? She said his name. I said, okay, now you are going to speak and we're all going to join with you in speak and we're going to call him back home. Ten times his name was called and the next day he came home. When they asked him when he had decided to come back home, it was the time in which that speaking had been done. You say, oh, I was lucky. No, no, it's cause and effect. Speaking to, speaking to, he wasn't, he wasn't in the building. He wasn't anywhere around. It wasn't uh, being broadcast on the radio or television. He wasn't in earshot. But he heard because words are powerful. Words are powerful. Uh, the Bible all, also speaks of speaking to a southern forest. In uh, Ezekiel 20, in verse 46, it says, Say to the southern forest, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign says. I'm about to set fire to you, and it will consume all your trees, both green and dry. The blazing flame will not be quenched, and every face from south and north will be scorched by it. So God says, he, you know, you can speak to territories in you know, he'll, he'll direct you if, if that. But I'm just giving you some examples of the kinds of things that God speaks to and he tells us to speak to because here he's telling the prophet to say to the southern forest, the southern forest, the land of Israel in Ezekiel chapter 21. And this is uh, several times used in the Bible. And I'm only giving you a few examples. God says, I want you to say to Israel, say to Jerusalem, say to the land of uh, uh, and, and prophesy against the land of Israel. So you're, you're speaking to, to the land. Oh, but yes, Pastor, but, but we know really the land of Israel is, is a figure of speech referring to uh, the nation. As, well, that's fine. However you want to interpret that, speak to the land. Speak to the land where your children are that's not the place they should be. Speak to that land. Go ahead. It's in the Bible. The city of Tyre. In Ezekiel 26 and verse 15, God tells the prophet to speak to the city. How do you speak to a city when there's no radio or television? <laughs> he says, I want you to speak, to speak. You know, I'm reminded of this. And I, I, I like you, I'm, I'm a learner. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to learn how to live on this earth with heaven's tools and resources and weapons. And uh, I, I was reminded as I was kind of studying this, I went to South Africa and we were waiting for someone to come and take us uh, to do a little shopping on one of our downtimes or days off. And it wasn't a day off, but it was. It was and so uh, they, they let us out at one location and somebody was to pick us up and take us to another location while we were waiting. Uh, we kind of walked out and I saw that it was a building site. I was with one of the brothers from the church. And, uh, and I just felt to go and, and speak and release the glory of God over this building site. I said, well, what sense does that make? I, I don't know. I don't have to understand everything to be obedient to the Lord. And so I did. I just kind of walked out to the edge of this hillside where all this construction work was going on. And I spoke and I said, I just released the glory of God on this whole place, this, this whole area. And, and I felt good for doing it. Uh, you say, Pastor, did you understand what you were doing? No, but I felt good for doing it. So this other brother and I, we, we, we walked down the hill and walk around and 
thought, okay, we'll, we'll just kind of go over and see some, some of the people who are working. And as, as we, we walked over, uh, my brother who was from the church there spoke in their language and, and, uh, there was a woman with a hard hat on and she was giving instructions to people and she, uh, responded. And so we walked over and a few minutes later, that woman and another woman who was talking with her had the most amazing divine encounter with God as we spoke to them. I want to tell you that there's a cause and effect relationship between words spoken in faith, directed by the Holy Spirit, put in your heart. They can make a difference in communities, in people's lives. So uh, Satan, God tells us to speak to Satan as God spoke to Satan in Ezekiel 28 and in verses 11 to 14. We see here, God says, Son of man, take up a lament concerning the king of Tyre and say to him, this is what the sovereign Lord says. You were the model of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. All right, let me help you with this. He says, say to the king of Tyre. Well, the king of Tyre, as you'll see, is not a earthly king, but it is the king behind the king, as you will easily see from these verses, because there's no earthly king that fits this word that comes forth. It says, you were the model of perfection, full of wisdom, perfect in beauty. You were in Eden. Well, there was no king, in Ty a king of Tyre who was in Eden. It was the king behind the king, as you'll see. You were in Eden, the garden of God. I mean, you couldn't get in Eden anymore. <laughs> the angels guarding the way, so they, he had to be in there. <laughs> Every precious stone adorned you, ruby, tobaz, emerald, so on and so forth. Your settings and mountings were made of gold. On the day you were created, they were pre prepared. Verse 14, you were anointed as a guardian cherub. So there's no king of Tyre, literally, that would have been a guardian cherub that would have been eaten. So we understand that we can interpret the scripture from the scripture. And we understand here that God is saying, this is God's judgment being pronounced against Satan, the king behind the king, who was in the garden, who corrupted himself through pride. You were on the holy mount of God and you walked among the fiery stones. So God tells us to speak to Satan. Uh, Matthew 16, 23, uh, there's other references to this, but let's take this one. Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me, Satan. Was he calling Peter Satan? No, he was actually speaking to Satan. Because he says Satan, but he, he said it to Peter, but he said it to Satan. Well, what came out of Peter was satanic. Its origin was from Satan. So Jesus speaks to Satan. He speaks directly, directly, directly to Satan. Pastor, you, you seem to be emphasizing this too, but absolutely. And so Jesus gives a command. He says, get behind me, Satan. And he rebukes Satan. I, I remember we were in a, a, uh, some meetings in India, and they asked us to come and, uh, urgently to somebody's house just before the meetings were to start. And so I went with the pastor who was... Uh, leading the, the meetings, and we, we walk to the, the edge of the, this large area where the meetings are being held, and we went into somebody's home. I didn't know uh, where we were going or why we were going. I just knew that we were supposed to go urgently to these people's home, and when we got there, we were informed that this family had a, a demon-possessed son who was about 20 years old. And so we got there, and they tried to get the young man to come in to the house uh, so he could receive ministry, but he refused. 
So mom and dad went out and took him by the hand and they brought him in the house. And as soon as he got in, he did everything he could to get to the other side of the room because he didn't want anything to do with two strangers who had just turned up. Now, it's my sense that it wasn't his wanting to stay away, but it was those demon spirits. Long story short, all we did was spoke words to those spirits. We didn't address the parents. We didn't ask God. We didn't say, Lord, I thank you that this won't, uh, won't bother him anymore. We weren't thanking God that something was, because when you thank God, that's an assumption. We were speaking to something. We were speaking to spirits. And so we said to those spirits in Jesus' name, go. And the spirits left. We went back and had the services. After the service, they came and told us the boy was totally transformed, changed, received Christ as his Savior. And he, he was a normal 20-year-old young man. His ability to converse, to be coherent, uh, to be reasonable and cooperative was radically different. Now, that's not because I'm anybody significant at all. It's because of words spoken to. Words spoken to. The Bible says that we are to speak to dead, dry bones. And you can you know that great story of from Ezekiel of speaking to the dry bones and the dead dry bones. I mean, uh, they're, they're dry and they're dead and they're dead dry. <laughs> In Ezekiel 34, so then he said to me, prophesy to these bones. You know, if you went to see uh, someone who prepared a skeleton in a coroner's office said, excuse me, would you go out for a little bit? I just want to speak to these bones. They'd say, uh, we have some tablets for you. Uh, you're, you're not really, uh, I mean, what, what, would, what would you gain just speaking to some bones? Well, my Bible, well, okay, fine. We, we knew you were different. But here, God says, prophesy, speak to these bones and say to them dry bones here you see all this is different from our earthly life we're not used to this we don't think things that hear uh, i mean th anything can hear that doesn't have ears no we, we we don't think it can but everything that's been created was created by God who spoke. And so everything can hear. Everything can hear. So the Bible also gives an example of speaking to wind from Ezekiel 37 and verse 9. As he said to me, prophesy to the wind. Prophesy and say to the wind, this is what the Lord God says, wind, come from the four winds and breathe on these people who were killed so they can come back to life. So you can speak to the wind. Wind it can hear. Wind can hear. Uh, we find mountains uh, can hear. Matthew 21, 21 says, I tell you the truth, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what was done to the fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go throw yourself. You can say to this mountain, to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea. Everybody has mountains. Even if you live on the plain, you have mountains. You have things that seem larger than you, that seem in your way, that seem opposed to you. What are you going to do? Well, you can go on the internet. You can Google it. You can get frustrated. You can learn all about it. You can get all the science, all the history, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But at some point, God wants you to look up. 
come to the throne of grace, change your position because you've changed your perspective, and then speak to something that is now inferior to you with spiritual authority. Say to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea, and it will be done. Speak to a fig tree. Another example that Jesus gives us, uh, he says, you, you can speak to the fig tree. You can say, be cursed in Jesus' name. Seeing a fig tree by the road, he went to it, found nothing on it except leaves. And he said, may you never bear fruit again. And immediately the tree withered. You know, there's some stuff that needs to wither in your life, in your current experience. Stop worrying about it. That's a sin. You're only making it worse. It's only getting bigger. And the more you talk about it, the bigger it gets. Speak to it. Command it to wither in Jesus' name. Rock. Yes, God told Moses to speak to a rock. Now we know that he disobeyed and he smote the rock instead of speaking to it. And God's plan was for him to speak to the rock. We saw, saw that in Numbers 20, verse 8. And God says, if you speak to the rock, they will with their own eyes see water come out of a rock. By speaking to a rock. Speaking to a rock. There are some hard things that are waiting to hear your word. Let me say that one more time. There's some really hard things that are waiting to hear your word so the water of life can come forth out of that experience. Body parts. We know Jesus spoke to body parts in, in uh, Mark 7, 34. He spoke to body parts. Jesus left that place and went to the vicinity of Tyre and uh, entered a house and didn't want anyone to know yet. He couldn't keep his, his uh, presence secret. Verse 34. I think it's, uh, I think I can uh, pull that one up here. I might have made an error. It's hard to believe, but... Uh, <laughs> Mark 7, 34. It says, He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. And at this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. He said basically to this man's ears, be opened. Now, you know, it seems like a great contradiction. And this is part of the problem that we have in daily life is that we, we, we operate so much by logic and science and training and education. I'm not decrying, the, but I'm just saying where they fit in the priority of how to live well. He spoke to ears that couldn't hear and said, be opened. Be opened. Be opened. Be opened. I think God wants to speak to our ears today and say to us, be opened so we hear and we receive something that makes a difference in our lives and our world. Storms. Jesus spoke to storms. He spoke to storms. He got up on the boat and said, you know, peace, be still. And he, then he rebuked the disciples and said, well, why didn't you use it? Why didn't you use your faith to do that? So he's trying to teach us that there's a norm, there's a standard, there's a means by which we address things in this life. We are to speak with authority. Jesus spoke to the dead, as you know. He spoke to Lazarus and he called him forth. He called him by name, a, a dead man. Dead, the dead can hear. The dead can hear. Jesus spoke to spirits in Mark 9, 25. So when Jesus saw that a crowd was running to the scene, he rebuked the evil spirit. You deaf and mute spirit. So what's the Bible telling us? He spoke to the spirit. He didn't say, Father, I thank you that the spirit will no longer. He wasn't making an assumptive prayer with thanksgiving. He was actually speaking to a spirit. And 
if I seem emphatic today, it's because I want us all to, to get this. Is that we need to come with this particular approach to some of those things that are hard and difficult and speak to them. Speak to them in Jesus' name. Luke 10 and verse 19. And I, I often uh, quote this, but uh, I quote it because I'm, I'm learning to live this, this life with this verse and, and other verses, of course. But here Jesus said, I've given you authority. If he's given you authority, then you have authority. Do you have authority? Well, I don't feel like I have authority. Well, it's not a matter of your feelings. Is God a liar? No, he's not a liar. Well, then you have authority. So you need to say it today. I have authority. I have authority. If I have authority, then I should use that authority. And if I have an authority to be used, it is meant to accomplish what God intends. I've given you authority to trample. There's some stuff that needs trampling in your life. To trample on snakes and scorpions. All those literal things are figurative of works of Satan. And to overcome. You have an authority to overcome. An authority to overcome. Excuse me. An authority to overcome. An authority to overcome. An authority to surrender to. An authority to be depressed by. No, you've been given authority to overcome. To overcome. Yeah, I, I know this, Pastor. Well, okay, let's, let's walk in it more. Let's walk in it more. Overcome all the power of the enemy. And then I like these last four words because it, it once again gives us the heaven standard of living. Nothing will harm you. You know, I started bleeding on Friday night. I didn't know it. I had no sensation of it. But the blood in this physical body was going out of my body. Had that not stopped, I would not be with you today. But the Bible says nothing will harm you. And so I'm back here because my assignment's not finished. My time isn't up. Nothing will harm you. You know, people are worried sick about so many things. They were first worried about the pandemic, especially as so many people started dying and the country went into emergency mode and the watchword was unprecedented. And it's still going on. And then people were worried about the economy, which they'll revisit that as well. And then they were worried about the second wave. Then they were worried about the vaccine. Ah, the vaccine is a secret plot, a conspiracy to, to track you, to destroy you, to watch you, to uh, immunize you to death, to, you know. And so, you know, they looked into the hellish Bible of the internet to find all kinds of information that brought no peace, no answers, only fear and further bondage. Instead of looking into what the book of James says, the perfect law of liberty. The perfect law of liberty and freedom. And God wants you and I to recognize that he gave us a standard for living. But pastor, you know, you're not young anymore. Uh, don't you get some attacks? I surely do. I surely do. I get attacks on my body. But I have a practice of speaking to them. And I encourage you to speak to everything that comes against you. Take the authority that God has given you. Overcome all that you are meant to overcome. The Bible really is teaching us that God has made you and me 
all of us together to be spiritual commanders and to command with authority the conditions that are contrary to what they should be so that we can reveal the love and the power of Christ to this world. You know, Jesus expressed the character of God through loving and through power. He had compassion on the sick and he healed them. He didn't just have compassion, but he had compassion with power and he healed the sick. And people saw that God loved them so much he, he would send somebody to do a miracle. And we're seeing it in Africa where food is a communication of the love of God intervening in people's lives. So God has put his word into your mouth. And I want to close today with just these verses and then we'll practice a little bit. Isaiah 51 and verse 16 says, I have put my words in your mouth and covered you with the shadow of my hand. I put my words in your mouth. Jeremiah 1 and verse 9, God speaks to Jeremiah and he says, I have put my words in your mouth. So God's words in your mouth is just an echo of God. If you will speak them, if you don't speak them, then you just live without them. Mark eleven twenty three. I tell you the truth, if anyone says, that's speaking, that's words. And then what's the next word in this verse? A most important preposition. He says, to. Not about, Lord, I, th Lord, I just thank you that these mountains are not going to be here tomorrow. That's an assumptive prayer of thanksgiving. You can give your thanksgiving, that's fine. Make your request with thanksgiving. But when it's time to use your authority, then use it. Don't back away from it. Approach it in some sort of modified way. Take the authority that you have and speak to it. If anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says, believes that what God said, no, believes that what he says, what you say, what I say, I believe that what I say is going to happen. It'll happen. It'll happen. And so we rehearse these things. We hear these things. We meditate in these things so that we can learn to do these things. We can learn to live differently. Well, pastor, I've tried that. Well, stop saying that and keep going. Don't be a wimp. You know, if you hold such a position of authority and you speak with such words of authority, and you have such provisions of supply and favor, what vaccine or conspiracy or disease on this earth is greater than who you are and who you have become by grace? So I'd like for us to, as we close today, practice a little bit this speaking with authority. And so we first come to the throne of grace. We look up to Jesus. And as soon as we look up, We've changed our position. We're not down here with our staff. We're up here with him at the throne of grace. We're now in a new position. We can look down on our staff and we can speak with authority. And so I want to give you five things that we're going to command now. And I want you to speak to these things. So we're going to command right now our new building to come to us in Jesus' name. And so... We're going to speak to the building that's, that you haven't maybe seen yet. <laughs> and we're going to command it to come to us now in Jesus' name. And so you can say it with me. Building, come to us now in Jesus' name. Now, let's speak to the job you don't have. And let's speak to the job. So here we go. Job, come to me now in Jesus' name. Let's speak to your children, perhaps, that have wandered away from Christ or who are struggling. Children, 
in Jesus' name, come back to Christ. In Jesus' name. Let's speak to the spirits that have been attacking your family. Some of you have been encountering some great spiritual conflict. You need to rise up, look down, and speak with authority. So here we go. Evil spirits harassing my family in Jesus' name, I command you to go. Be bound in Jesus' name. Some of you have health issues. So you, you speak to whatever issue you have with your body. And so if it's arthritis, then you speak to arthritis because arthritis has ears. It can hear. I know I've seen it many, many times as we have commanded arthritis and diabetes and high blood pressure and arrhythmia and tumors and cancers go when we spoke to them with authority. And so put in the word that you have, whether it's arthritis, say whatever else it is, alopecia, whatever condition it is. In Jesus' name, I command you to go now. In Jesus' name. You know, it's so important for us to learn to live by the manual, the eternal word of God. I want to encourage you to keep reading the manual for living, the manual for life and living, and listening to the great teacher, the Holy Spirit. Father, thank you today for your word. May each of us move more and more in our spiritual authority coming boldly to the throne of grace and receiving that grace and dispatching things, changing things, altering things, because we learn to speak with the authority that you've given us. Thank you, Lord, for healing sick bodies today and drawing families together. Thank you, Lord, for mending relationships. Thank you, Lord, for drawing families back to you. In Jesus' most precious and powerful name. Have an awesome week walking in who you are. God bless you.